special lecture today. Uh, it's special not just because we have an outstanding speaker, but because of the reason why uh, Dr. Bolton is here today. Uh, many of you know, maybe not all of you, that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, the work indeed started three years ago, we launched a, a new uh, prize and award given to the what we call, or we nominate probably ambitiously, the best climate think tank in the world. And what we do is to collect data, uh, no polls or opinions. I mean, it's really a, a long uh, and difficult work of collecting data about different uh, think tanks and research institutions around the world, um, data about their own publications, the impact factor of these publications, but also their own uh, communication dissemination strategy, the number of conferences they organize, or the number of, of international meetings uh, they will participate to, or uh, the newsletters and, and so on and so forth. So it, uh, it's a wide set of different indicators. Uh, we can do it for many uh, research uh, think tanks or uh, policy think tanks around the world, but not all of them, of course, because it's, it's quite time consuming. We, we do it for, for about uh, 70 of them carefully. And this is something important because this distinguishes us from other kind of similar, uh, similar uh, rankings. And we construct this ranking by aggregating these different indicators through sophisticated mathematical techniques based on Choke Integral, but that's not relevant. What is relevant is at the end we have, we have a ranking and we standardize this indicator by taking into account the size of the different think tanks and, and, uh, and research institutions. This is very important because all the other rankings uh, are biased uh, in favor of uh, larger or uh, uh, with more people, with more employees, the think tanks, whereas we take into account the, the, the dimension, the size of the think tanks, and by, by uh, providing a measure of the effectiveness or the productivity of each one. So we construct this, this ranking uh, this year. The winner of, uh, of the award has been uh, the Woods Hole Institute, uh, chaired by, by Dr. Bolton. We're quite happy um, to. Uh, Keep the, the award to the Woods Hole Institute. Uh, last year, just to remember, it was given to um, the Bilbao Climate uh, Center. It's in, with the Bilbao Climate Change Center, the BC3 is uh, a small one, uh, not a really large institution, but uh, given that we standardize the, 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 the amount of, uh, of publications, impacts, and so on and so forth, uh, they were able to get. Uh, to the top of the ranking uh, because last year they were really uh, productive. This year uh, they were second, so not, not bad. And first, so we got the, we got the uh, Woodson Institute. Uh, if I remember correctly, third was YASA. YASA is rather a, a, a big, big research center in, in, uh, in the end. So, as you can see, uh, there is a mix of, uh, of, of, of different uh, sizes, different features, even different focuses. So because the focus of me as the example, the focus of, of, of the, the boot soul. But, but still, uh, it, it seems to me that, that uh, the, this kind of ranking uh, works well, the kind of methodology we develop works well in identifying the, the most productive uh, um, think, climate think tank, uh, at least uh, year by year in this case, for uh, the year 2013. Uh, having said that, I, I think that before uh, listening uh, to the lecture, that, uh, that Richard Bolton will win the Liba, uh, we need to give him the prize. It has been uh, designed and conceived for this prize, and I'm uh, really happy to give you. Thank you very much. session uh, that I chair and at the end of which I, I announced the, the winner of the prize, there was a big applause from about 1,000 environmental economists from all over, all over the world. So uh, these young uh, and good researchers just joined all the other ones in, uh, in uh, confirming the appreciation of the effort of the Wolfsville Institute. So thank you very much. Wow. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I am indeed pleased and very much honored to get this, this prize. And it helps to be small, I guess, in this case. Um, no, it's a great recognition. It's uh, always something one never gets enough credit or recognition. So it's very nice. Big surprise. And um, it draws attention to the fact that the research we do is, is important has good impacts, and, um, and the work we do uh, focuses on the land-climate interaction, um, and, and focuses on particularly those places where carbon is most vulnerable. That's, think of permafrost in the Arctic and tropical forests. So uh, what just goes without saying is just a wonderful prize. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beyond Red, what management of land can and cannot do with respect to controlling atmospheric carbon dioxide. <clears throat> I'm going to have a very brief introduction of climate change, which I figure will be something you don't need at all, but it's short. Talk a little bit more about the global carbon cycle, <clears throat> and, then, and then get to the question of what, what we can do. So I'll just say a few things, as I say, about climate. It's, it, it's not a scientific controversy. There's a natural greenhouse effect. Concentrations of the gases responsible for human activity are increasing and the temperatures increase. And, and some information in terms of recent weather disasters in the 1990s, there were something like 200 per year on average. That's almost doubled to 350 weather-related disasters in the first decade of the 2000s. <clears throat> and all of this happened with a warming of less than one degree. So I'm also going to paraphrase or really quickly go through a recent report that was put out by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I liked it because it was 30 pages instead of thousands of pages as the IPCC does. But they made three points. One, science, climate scientists agree. That was their first point. There's not, there's not the controversy that sometimes the press plays up. That climate change is happening, it's here and now. <clears throat> and we're at risk of pushing our climate toward abrupt, unpredictable, and perhaps uh, perhaps irreversible changes with highly damaging impacts. And <clears throat> the sooner we act, the lower that risk and the lower the cost. There's a lot that we can do. That's all I want to say about climate. Um, let me do a quick overview again of the carbon cycle. Just uh, carbon cycle is simple in its conception anyway. It concerns four reservoirs, the atmosphere, oceans, land, and fossil fuels. I'm going to go through a series of um, uh, slides that show, here's, here's a zero flux, if you will. Below this are sinks of carbon or accumulations somewhere. Above it are sources to the atmosphere. So this first one shows emissions from, from land use change. It's called deforest, for deforestation, but it's broader than that. It's all kinds of changes in land use. And you can see that most of those emissions initially were from outside the tropics, from, from the North America, from Europe, Australia, and so on. And, and so over time, those emissions have declined, may even be small sinks now. And the tropics is where most of the sources are now from deforestation. <clears throat> this, this is an average for the period 2000 to 2006. I apologize for jumping around time, times from time in some different slides. This is from 1850, sorry, to 2010 or so. <clears throat> the annual emissions, in this case, from land, <coughs> land use change. And on top of that, we can look at the annual emissions from fossil fuels. <clears throat> and it's interesting that before about 1900 or so, most of the emissions came from, or more, more emissions came from land use. That's obviously <clears throat> changed. So where did these sources to the atmosphere go? They have to be balanced by accumulations somewhere. <clears throat> obviously, the atmosphere 
gets somewhat less than half of what's released each year stays in the atmosphere. And the oceans take up another quarter. And since I've gone through the four pools, major pieces of the carbon budget, fossil fuels, land, atmosphere, and oceans, the question is, what's this missing piece? And it's, it's also land. All of the evidence points to it's being land as well, but it's <clears throat> unmanaged land as opposed to this net release of carbon from such things as cultivation, deforestation, forestry, and so on. <clears throat> so for point number one is that there are two different terrestrial processes to keep track of. The first one is called direct human effects. Think of them as management. So it's, it's deforestation, it's the increase in croplands and pasture lands, it's logging and recovery of forests. <clears throat> And the second important uh, process that affects carbon storage on land are not related to human activity, at least directly. They're natural effects, usually thought to be environmentally induced, like changes in uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, or the amount of nitrogen available. These affect productivity on land and affect the carbon storage. I should uh, back up a little bit and make the point that this sink here in, the, in these unmanaged lands has never been, never been measured. It's been modeled. It's, it's pictured here just as the difference between the other terms that are better known, fossil fuel emissions, land use change, and the oceans and atmosphere. And, and just to make the carbon cycle balance, we have to have carbon, that much carbon accumulating on land. But the reasons for that are not altogether clear. As I say, these are some of the hypothesis. So <clears throat> here are the two processes, one largely due to management, one on land, something other than management is going on. And uh, just to talk first about a little bit more about the management aspects, this is a good slide because it shows clearly that there was more carbon standing on this hectare in the past than there is right now. Um, we, we use satellites around the world to look at changes in forest area. The red here is intact forest in, uh, I believe, Acre in Brazil, a state in Brazil. The light blue-green are clearings. Just for scale, the distance from one road to another is about five kilometers. So this is a big development project going on in the Amazon. And we use those sorts of data to help with recent changes in land use. <clears throat> then we couple that with a, a bookkeeping model that just points out that for a particular, for a hectare that's a forest that's cleared, crops are planted over some time, so the carbon values, the carbon content of that hectare is much reduced. If it's abandoned and grows back, these simplified and idealistic curves show the accumulation of carbon again there. Products taken off that decay over time. Slash is, think of it as debris that goes along with harvesting or with clearing. That decays over time as well. And, and soil carbon with cultivation and use carbon from soil. All of those together define the changes on land that you'd expect. And then this, this slide shows that what the atmosphere sees, which is a big pulse, a year or two following deforestation, and then a lower release. And then, in fact, a, an uptake of carbon <coughs> when lands abandoned and grows back. So it doesn't look like it, but this, the sink here is approximately the same as the source, given that the ecosystem completely recovers from um, and so results from that model show emissions, annual emissions from 1850 to 2010. The blue line is changes in land use globally. The red line is fossil fuels. <clears throat> and it's important to point out that that source from 1850 to the present is a, is a net source. And that means it includes both sources and sinks of carbon. For example, if you harvested wood, took it out of the forest, the products are oxidized and 
add carbon to the atmosphere, but if the forest is allowed to recover, it takes carbon back out. So all, all kinds of management that <clears throat> we can document are included in here. Um, and here, this is, just shows an example where in this column we have the net flux, most of it's from deforestation in the tropics, little bits added from <clears throat> shifting cultivation increases from fuel wood harvest and, and, um, and soils, and so those are included. But if instead of just looking at, at the net, <coughs> if, you can, if you think of the gross uh, emissions and the gross uptake, <clears throat> you have much larger cycling of carbon or dynamics, if you will. So the outside boxes are shifting cultivation. The net effect of shifting cultivation is small, but the gross effects are large. The same thing is true for harvest. Uh, and um, for uh, the deforestation, the gross fluxes and the net are about the same. Um, <clears throat> So let me say one or two things about the indirect or natural sources and sinks of carbon. Again, that's this green band that is calculated by difference, so we don't really have a way either of measuring it directly or knowing what it's caused by. <clears throat> uh, and the interesting thing is that over the last 50 years or so, the sinks in land and ocean have increased. They've increased in proportion to the emissions. The more we put into the atmosphere, the bigger these sinks are. And that's sort of remarkable to me. Uh, nature's been on our side, taking up half of what we release to the atmosphere. Um, it's not what I would expect. As the oceans get warmer, you'd expect they'd take up less carbon. Or as they become more acidic from carbon dioxide, they would also take up less carbon. And the same is true on land. As the land warms up, you'd expect if respiration would come to be affected more than photosynthesis, and there might be less of a sink on land. <clears throat> but the terrestrial sink is in fact three times larger than this management source that I'm talking about. It's pushing three billion metric tons or pentagrams of carbon instead of something closer to one. Uh, <clears throat> and I've made the point that that, that, that while well, I want to natural sink plotted here as a, as a sink is composed of, again, both sources and sink. So if there's foaming in the permafrost and a release of carbon from that part of the world, it's included in this natural component and it just means that the, that the real sinks are larger than, well, that the sinks total something larger than this net sink. And the hypotheses again are that CO2 <coughs> is for, higher CO2 is fertilizing plant growth, that nitrogen deposition from human activities is indirectly affecting growth of natural systems, and <coughs> changes in climate may be having a positive effect on carbon storage. Uh, but will they continue? Will the sinks continue in proportion to emissions? That's a big. That's the big question. Uh, and and if, they, if the sinks are beginning to decline already, and there's some evidence, controversial, that they are, to the extent those sinks we've been counting on for 50 years decline, then more of the carbon that's emitted stays in the atmosphere, the rate of climatic disruption increases, it's a lot more difficult to, met, to manage carbon if these natural sinks do not continue. And finally, the carbon cycle is not behaving as the projections have assumed, which is that land and oceans will continue to take up carbon in proportion to emissions. Um, so perhaps the only way to avoid those declining or even reversing sinks is, is to limit the rate and extent of, of climate warming. <clears throat> All right, finally, what can we do? Uh, well, we have to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere, and there are two ways to do that, reduce emissions or increase the uptake. Um, let's think first about the management options, and that is you can 
we know the things you can do to reduce emissions. They're incorporated in, in the red mechanism. And if you just think about the net sources from land as a result of management versus fossil fuels, it's a little bit misleading because we come to the conclusion gee, it's only about 10 or 15 percent of, of the carbon emitted. So you know, it doesn't seem like playing with this land use is management is going to get you very much. But as I said, that's misleading. I'll come back to that. Um, what we have to do to stabilize the concentration, I'm arguing, is just reduce emissions by about four petagrams a year, by about 50%. So I'll show you. Here's the carbon budget. Most of the emissions are from fossil fuels. Uh, in fact, this was the average during the decade 2000-2010. It's pushing 10 petagrams of carbon per year this year, 2004. Um, land use change, again, is a small fraction of the total emissions. But here's what accumulates in the atmosphere on average during that decade. Four petagrams of carbon per year. So if we could reduce these emissions to something on the order of four, then this should go to zero because the uptake by oceans and land will continue the gradient is still there, the concentrations are still high, and these woods will continue for a while, not forever, because at some point it's come to the living, right? You can reduce emissions by four pentagrams of carbon per year, then we, then we will stabilize the CO2 concentration for at least a while. <clears throat> um, and we can do that by managing forests. If we stop deforestation, that saves us somewhere between one or two petagrams a year. If we allow existing forests to grow, there are a lot of young forests out there, that can that, that could accumulate one to three petagrams of carbon per year. And finally, if we expand the area of forests in a big way, 500 million hectares or something, we might store a petagram of carbon per year that way. Adding them all up gives us reduced emissions or increased uptake that, that's equivalent to three to five petagrams of carbon per year. Um, <clears throat> this is a, as I say, this is a large area that if reestablished in trees, we take up so much. It's, um, it's a number I've worked with is 500 million hectares. That's assuming an uptake of two petagrams two uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year, which is not outrageous. It's not, it's pretty conservative. 500 million hectares is a big area. It's about half of the United States or half of China. But it's three times larger than the area in currently in croplands. And it's five times, sorry, <coughs> three times less. And five times less than the area currently in pastures. So it's not inconceivable that we could manage that as well. And if, we, and if we do that, notice that we, uh, we have, for at least a while, uh, an increase in the atmosphere that's nothing. We've taken the one petagram source and turned it into a two to four petagram sink by doing these monstrous things. And um, so we've stabilized the concentration, at least for a while. Uh, it's not going to be easy. There will be risks involved. Forests don't accumulate carbon indefinitely. Eventually they mature and they're not taking up carbon anymore. They're holding it, but they're not removing it from the atmosphere. So the point is, this is just, it's not a full solution. It's sort of, it's an interim solution. It get, buys time or gives you a bridge to replace fossil with some more renewable form of energy. That won't happen overnight. That is presumably something that would take decades. And this use management of land strategically can be timed to coincide and keep the CO2 concentration from continuing to increase. Um, as I say, the natural land and ocean sinks have to continue for this to work. Uh, the carbon in forests is vulnerable. It's not like the carbon underground that's pretty safe. Carbon put in forests is vulnerable to diseases and fires and such as that. 
we have to find suitable land areas of, of, of that order of magnitude that I mentioned, 500 million hectares or so. A lot of that will depend on how much carbon is built. The price on carbon is really important in this. There will be intense competition for land, only more so in the future, and then one must be careful of the rights and equity in this sort of use of forests and land with the competition that's coming. So it's not at all easy. So let's think about these indirect or natural effects that land systems have on, on the carbon budget. Um, just a quick review, I'm talking about both the direct effects of management and the natural effects. I've mentioned that today we, can, we have the potential going from a pedogram source to two for pedogram sink with, a, with some intensive management, intensive and expensive. Uh, when we think about the natural effects, right now, the, recently that sink has averaged about 2.8 pedograms of carbon per year. Uh, we don't know the potential in the future. It could stay, it could increase under the most optimistic conditions, or, or it could decline, become a smaller value, and conceivably it could reverse and become a source if the temperature of the Earth goes up and up. So I wanted to bring out not, not, a, uh, not an answer or a solution, but more a question to you people here in particular having to do with governance. How do we account for the sources and sinks from land? Well, we, <clears throat> we have RED, RED plus, the Kyoto Protocol, and what follows that to address management, the direct effects. We don't really have anything I know of to address the natural effects. Um, I think of these as national, or private in a sense. This, this sort of, I think of this as communal, it's common property, it's, it's the global commons, if you will, and, and we haven't thought about ways for incorporating such a mechanism into uh, carbon management, if you will. But an example of it is, uh, you can imagine at, some, at a global level, reducing or requiring that sources be reduced even more if the atmospheric increase were to get larger, or vice versa, for years or some sequence of, of years where the sources are smaller than expected, you might uh, allow carbon to be banked or set aside for years when nature has not been quite as uh, liberal. All right, so in conclusion, let me say that the highest priority has to be not to be on reducing fossil fuels, and I haven't talked about that at all, so it's a, in one sense a really biased talk. I've been concentrating on land, but uh, fossil fuels shouldn't go shouldn't escape the uh, notice that they have that they're big they're the big culprit. That's that's where a lot of the attention has to be, how to reduce fossil fuel use or emissions. But in the meantime, as I suggested, there's a strategic use of forest and land that could reduce emissions enough to stabilize the CO2 concentrate concentration at least for some 40 or 50 years perhaps. Uh, and in that case, management on land changes from being 10 to 15 percent of the problem to being about 50 percent of the solution. There's much potential there. <clears throat> um, and it's urgent in the sense that this sink in natural systems is, has been uh, working in the, has been helping with carbon management. And it's, it's possible that if those sinks decline, or in fact become sources that kind of management will be much more difficult and, and insignificant compared to nature. Um, which would bring some of the dangers of climate change, extreme weather, crop failure, sea level rise, forest die off, and <coughs> things of that sort. So we have to stabilize the concentrations. When and at what concentration? I uh, Two degrees centigrade has been set out there as sort of a, as sort of a goal of not to exceed a warming of two degrees. It's sort of a compromise between what 
safe and what's dangerous, or it's a compromise between what the scientists say and what is seen as possible politically. In fact, there's very little scientific basis for two degrees. Two degrees may be too much. But uh, we're already, we've seen about three quarters of a degree C rise, and we're committed to something about that same amount as the oceans heat and catch up with the atmosphere. So we're committed to a warming that's close to two degrees away. And uh, you, you, I hope you're not all familiar with this, but this is, I think this is a really effective illustration that came out in science a few years ago. It's, um, <clears throat> on this axis is, is a climate target, for example, in 2010, let's say, that, let's say the target is two degrees. What these lines show you are the rate of fossil, rate of emissions, rate of uh, reduction in emissions necessary to stay within the two degree warming target. So for example, in 2010, we should be reducing our emissions by somewhat less than 3%. If you wait to 2020, it's somewhat more than 3%. <clears throat> if you wait till 2030, it's more than 5% per year. And in fact, emissions went up last year by went up 2.3% instead of down. And if you wait to 2050, you, there's no way we can be less than a two degree warming. Easy to understand that if you think of where we are today with respect to one degree warming, it's, it's off the table. It's not going to happen. And hence the uh, urgency. If we want to limit the warming to two degrees, we'll have to start now and we have about 25 years or so. So I don't think we're going to make it, actually. I think we'll be more than two degrees and have to come back down. <clears throat> We have to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We can do that at the same time as we restore the biosphere. Um, and I'm going to end just with four of these slides to, to make the point. You've seen this already, but the, the challenge is to reduce, or sorry, to stabilize the concentration in the atmosphere so that that concentration is not rising anymore. The way to do that is to reduce emissions from somewhere about nine or 10 or more to just four to six, then you have the opportunity to stabilize here. And the way to reduce emissions in one case is through land use change, managing land, as I mentioned, three aspects of, and of course the big one is fossil fuels. But <clears throat> we have um, something on the order of two or three decades to, to really make the transition from fossil to renewable sources of energy. Energy and I will stop there.